The E86 BMW Z4 Coupe is perhaps one of those BMWs that's overlooked, you know, a bit forgotten about. There's just not many of these cars around and having owned mine for the last month or so now, I really want to get in depth on this car and talk about its strengths and weaknesses and perhaps why it is one of the BMWs that we've all forgotten about and why more people aren't buying them. Now, if you've watched the first video I did on this car where I talked about some of the reasons I bought it, I did mention one of the standout features, of course, is the way it looks. Now, it's a very, very minimalistic design, something that we're just not seeing on modern day BMWs anymore. We've got some subtle creases, you know, the one that runs from the door right over that front wheel arch and the other one that runs right over the rear wheel arch as well, really kind of giving it a wide road presence. I think it just looks fantastic overall. And one of the things that I really love about this car is the fact that there are no fake vents in sight. Something that unfortunately we're just seeing all over the place on new cars, not just BMWs, but all the German manufacturers, to be honest. And it is a real shame. There's just something really special about a nice, beautiful design that's simple. One of the standout features of the way this car looks is that almighty long bonnet, to be honest. And it, it's very kind of reminiscent of GT cars. And that's really what this car is all about. It's a bit of a cross between a GT and a sports car. It's not particularly hard edged. It's kind of like a mix between the two. So yeah, it's, it really makes this thing stand out. It's really very unique. And to be honest, even the Z4s of today have still kind of got that architecture that we're seeing on the E86 platform here. Now, if you're familiar with the Roadster counterpart to this car, the E85, you'll know there are some fundamental differences to how the two cars look. That's the Coupe versus the Roadster. I mean, one of the main differences, of course, is the rear end because we've got a hard top Coupe. It's a fully fixed roof, no convertible. We will get onto how that affects handling with the chassis rigidity a little bit later on. But one of the things I wanted to talk about now is how this boot line comes into a sort of a beautiful, elegant, I suppose, integrated spoiler on this rear deck lid. And it just finishes the rear of the car off very nicely indeed. So I'm overall, I'm, I'm really sold on the way this car looks. And I think it's stunning. It's a really, really timeless piece of design. And even now, well, this car was released in 2006. So what are we looking at, 15 years on? The design, it really hasn't aged in the slightest. So I think BMW have done a fantastic job on the way this car looks. One of the really surprising things about the E86 platform is just how usable it is and how much storage space there is. If we pop the boot here, you can hopefully get a bit of an idea of what I'm talking about. Of course, we've got all the usual camera gear in here, which is quite a bit of stuff. And this boot is perfectly adequate. We've got kind of like this parcel shelf that runs down and it, it retracts automatically. So if you wanted extra space, you know, height wise, you can just pull that back and that'll give you tons of space. So it's really a very usable car and you can definitely use it as a daily like I've been doing recently. So absolutely uh, fantastic job there. And yeah, perfectly usable car. As you can see, my car has the 18 inch Z4 M wheels on it. And these weren't a factory option. These were actually fitted later, but I think they're some of the best looking wheels you can get on the E86 platform. They did come with the, I can't remember the style number, but it was like a five spoke design. It's like a split rim. I think they look okay, but they certainly kind of date the car a little bit these days. And apparently they get quite bad corrosion issues as well. These are in really nice condition. I think they look great. Again, just helping to make this car look a lot younger than it actually is. I've got some Michelin Pilot Sports on the front, and this is interesting because the date code actually puts these at 2008, but they look in fantastic condition and there's barely any cracking on them. So I'm not really sure what the story is there, but there's no way these have been on the car, you know, the whole 12 years of its life. So yeah, I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna do there yet, but they seem to hold up pretty well. There's plenty of grip. They're not, you know, all dry and hard like older tires can get, but I may switch these out to Michelin Pilot Sport 4s, which I've got on the rear as well. So. Yeah, we'll have a think about that. But these are actually a 225 section tire, 255 section tire on the rear. And what do you notice about this? Plenty of sidewall. Again, something we're not seeing in modern cars. And of course, this means it rides pretty well considering, you know, the suspension setup it's got and the size of the alloys. So yeah, it, it's really great. And obviously with the nice wide tires, you get plenty of mechanical grip as well. Something we'll get onto a little bit later on. Now the interior of the E86 is something we obviously touched on in my first video but I definitely want to revisit this a little bit. And, you know, as I mentioned in that video, it's effectively bespoke to this car. It's not like the modern parts bin specials that we see today across BMW and other brands, to be honest, where the interiors are effectively shared entirely across the whole range. And there's very little sort of differentiation between the different models. In this car, of course, we've got this steering wheel, which is effectively unique to the Z4, at least as far as I'm aware. And I really like the way it feels. We'll get onto that a little bit later on, but it's a good size rim, very easy to use. But, you know, ergonomically in here, 
It's a very comfortable place to be. These seats are fantastically supportive. Again, it's like a perfect balance between kind of good bolstering, but not too hard and not too uncomfortable for longer journeys as well. Again, kind of going back to that whole idea of a cross between a GT and a sports car. Everything's just laid out well. I mean, you know, everything's at easy reach. The pedals are easy for heel and toe. The gear change is in the perfect position. You know, you don't really have to kind of like bend yourself around too much like you do in some sports cars. In mine, I've got this nav system. A lot of people don't like that because it dates the car, but it doesn't bother me too much and it all works very well, to be honest, I can't really fault it. It's just a very simplistic design. It's minimalistic. Again, like BMWs of this era were. Plenty of storage space in here as well. We've got kind of like a, you know, a little like center console storage behind. There's some pockets behind the seats as well and a glove box. So again, plenty of room really in here. And, you know, with the double bubble roof as well, we have loads of headroom. If you were kind of over six foot, I don't imagine you have any issues sitting in here for long periods of time. So yeah, it's, it's very, very well done in here. I really like it actually. It kind of reminds me a little bit of my E30 BMW, just the way it's very simple and not over the top with the information that's kind of in your face. So yeah, great job in here as well. So here we are then, out on the road in my E86 Z4 Coupe. And this is really where this car is at home, for it is a through and through driver's car. I guess we better start with the engine then, which is the N52 B30. And what that means is it's a three litre naturally aspirated straight six. Interestingly, it's a magnesium and aluminium sort of mix of materials in the engine block, which means it's very lightweight. And if I'm not mistaken, when this engine was first introduced, it was the lightest production six-cylinder engine in the world, which is really quite impressive. So some headline stats then, 265 horsepower at 6,600 RPM, 232 foot-pounds of torque at 2,750 RPM. Now I've touched on this briefly in my first video on this car, but that's a very, very impressive point in the rev range for a naturally aspirated engine to make peak torque. And that's ultimately thanks to double Vanos on the intake and exhaust camshafts and also the Valtronic system. Essentially what this allows the engine to do is breathe very, very efficiently and produce great power and also give great economy. But above all else, makes a fantastic sound. It revs to 7,000 RPM, which means it's got so much to give and it's such a rewarding engine to rev out. It's got all these different characteristics, plenty of low down torque, and then it just screams right up to rev line, making power, of course, right up near the top end of the rev range. So let's get it on some slightly better roads then, see what this thing's like. <laughs> Listen to that. Just there's so much induction noise that is just emanating into this cabin. It's just unbelievable. And this is one of the reasons why I bought this car. It's around that 5,000 RPM mark. It really starts to resonate, but it's not awfully loud. It's not kind of too much to live with, especially as you can use the engine below 5,000 RPM so easily. 
we've got a really crisp gear shift as well. It's, it's such a tight gear shift, really, really sort of tactile feel to it. You can feel exactly what the linkage is doing. It's very, very precise. So we put the power on through a corner there. It just pulls so nicely. And we'll get the heel and toe in. Oh, it's just fantastic. This is really what driving is all about. <laughs> it feels so capable as well. I guess, I guess the next thing we can talk about is the steering. It's actually an EPAS system. Now, basically that means it's an electronically assisted steering rack as opposed to hydraulic. And it's quite an early EPAS system as well. I mean, most cars back when this was introduced in 2006 used a hydraulic rack, but it's very, very good. And I think that comes down to, well, basically this thing has a wide track and wide tires, which means, you know, one of the disadvantages of that is it follows canvas a lot, especially on our British B roads. However, what that means is you get an awful lot of feedback through this wheel, especially with a thin rim, of course, and it just means you can really get a great idea of what the front end's doing at every single point in time. And that's what I love about it. It's just a very, very talkative rack, much better than some of the more recent BMWs I've driven with e -pass systems as well. The suspension, well, it's pretty good. It's a pretty firm ride, which is exactly what you would expect on a car like this. It can be a little bit crashy at times, but you know, you buy a car like this and you expect a firm ride. So I'm not too bothered about the fact it is a little bit crashy. You can certainly drive around that just by, you know, trying to avoid potholes and just keeping an eye on the road surface in front of you. But it feels fantastic. Weight in this car is 1,320 kilos. It's almost an exact 50-50 weight distribution front to rear, which means it feels incredibly well balanced. And you can feel that the front end's got so much grip, but it doesn't feel like the back end can't keep up. The whole time the chassis just feels incredibly capable. Of course, with such wide tires as well, you get an awful lot of mechanical grip, which means you can really chuck this thing as the corners with a lot of confidence. And that's ultimately one of the things I find with this chassis. Because it's so rigid due to the hard top that's twice as rigid as the e85 roadster actually but it just means that everything just feels so tight and yeah you can really put faith in it yeah, let's go for the first gear oh, fantastic so 0 to 60 in this car is actually 5.7 seconds top speed is limited to 155 miles an hour so that is pretty ample performance if you ask me I don't know who can want anything more than that really it'll actually do quite a surprising economy figure as well this car it can quite easily do 30 miles per gallon sometimes 31 32 on longer motorway runs which is really impressive for a 3 litre naturally aspirated straight six so yeah you kind of get the best of both worlds you get that fantastic performance it almost feels like a baby M engine the way it revs and the way it delivers power but you've got you know such good reliability with the n52 and also it's very very efficient it's 3000 rpm in fourth it just pulls so hard absolutely fantastic on the rear end then we've got an open differential which you know isn't as good as a limited slip diff but actually in conjunction with the traction control system in this car it feels really really good almost like a limited slip diff to be honest i have barely felt any of the open diff traits that we're all used to and yeah it's just a fantastic kind of setup overall and on these great british b roads actually the steering is a really good ratio it's nice and quick, not too quick, but just about perfect. And the weighting of the steering's great as well. And actually, while we're talking about that, there is a sport mode in this car. I have never used it. I doubt I ever will, because all it does is shortens the throttle pedal and weighs up the steering. So it's just not something that I'm really interested in. I think the throttle response is amazing as it is. You blip of the throttle instantly up to 3000 RPM. So I don't know who would want anything more than that. And as I say, the weight of the steering is perfect anyway.
Yeah, it's just such an occasion every single time I get in this car to take it on a nice road and just enjoy it. It requires engagement, it requires good driving. It's not like the modern day stuff where you can just mash the throttle pedal, the automatic gearbox does everything. You know, this car needs to be driven and it'll it's basically as good as the driver is. So if you're not a great driver, this car is not gonna, you know, perform to its full potential. And that's what I love about it because you've got to learn, you've got to develop with the car. You've got to kind of get that fluidity between the pedals, between the, the steering and also how the car behaves. You should never get bored of that six cylinder soundtrack. I really don't. The brakes are pretty decent, but they do leave something to be desired, you know. This is an area of BMW where brakes are notoriously not amazing. They're just not really beefy enough, generally speaking. You had that a lot with the older M cars. They just couldn't live up to the abuse that those cars had. And not that this car gets abused or anything like that, but when you're driving a bit harder, you can definitely feel the brakes getting hot. I've never had any serious brake failure or anything like that, but you can just tell they're just not quite as sharp as, say, the JCW brakes I had before with those massive four-piston Brembos. So, to summarize the experience with the Z4 Coupe then, well, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a through and through driver's car and that's ultimately what I'm bothered about. That's the reason why I bought this car and it delivers on every single front. Another thing is just the value for money you get with these. Right now you can get in one of these E86 3 litre SI models for as little as, what, six, seven thousand pounds here in the UK. And for you know much nicer examples with lower mileage, anywhere up to eighteen or twenty thousand. Of course, though, like many older cars at the minute, especially older BMWs, they are appreciating, and I think it's kind of well deserved, if you like. As I've mentioned a few times, I definitely think this is a car that many people have overlooked. It's just not something you see about. Everyone just forgets about this, I suppose, and that's because so few of them were brought to the UK. So few of them were made in general. In the UK, we got something like 260 manual three litre SI coupes. So they're just not, there's not loads about. And ultimately that sort of rarity factor is one of the things that's going to contribute to the price. And I think honestly, these things are only gonna go up. It's, if not already a modern classic, it's, it's really kind of on the borderline of that status now. And I think it's very well deserved. So yeah, to summarize then, if you are looking at a Z4 Coupe, three liter SI, probably even the M model, I haven't driven an M, but driving the three liter SI, I imagine the M is just as good, probably a lot better. And that speaks volumes. So yeah, definitely do not hesitate to buy one. Go out there and get one while you still can. It'll be one of the best cars you've driven. Thank you.